Hello, it's Dean Ryan here at bookmakers.com TV. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Liam Canning, at Liam Paul Canning on Twitter. A Liam, pleasure to, uh, well, virtually meet you. Uh, we can't obviously be in the same room. We're in different countries, of course, but uh, a, a, a man with Man United close to his heart, of course, actually in Manchester. Um, why don't we talk about last night, Liam? Because I thought I'd be chatting to you today, uh, commiserating on one of the worst starts for Man United ever in the Premier League. But I guess... You know, what we saw last night was a massive turnaround. Perhaps Liverpool weren't at their best, Liam, but what we got from United was something we haven't seen for a while. Correct. Thanks for having me, Dean. Yeah, I, I think it was a shock to everyone who watched the game. Um, if you saw, obviously, against Brighton, Brentford, United just weren't at the races and there was no aggression, there was no passion. They sort of went heads down as they have over the last 12 to 18 months as soon as they concede. But yesterday... The crowd was there for other reasons, perhaps, of against the Glazers and the owners. Mm. But they got behind the team straight away. Um, I think the the energy in the ground really helped the players. I think, on, on contrast to that, if they had gone down 1-0, you know, in, in the opening 15 minutes, perhaps it would be a different story, it must be said. But they got the early goal through James Sancho, which was beautifully worked and a proper team goal that. Um, and then they just kicked on. You know, there was a few shaky moments through, you know, towards the back end of the first half and... The last 10 minutes, as soon as Liverpool had scored through Salah, um, that was a little bit nervy. But overall, I think United were just the better team, which is somewhat surprising to say, mm. perhaps, um, especially against this, you know, imperious Liverpool team under Klopp. Um, yeah. But to a man, I think United were just absolutely fantastic and, and, and hard, made bold decisions, made big decisions and was vindicated for them. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, apart from the protests that happened before the game and then they're kind of like subdued because... You know, the owners and the manager will re- out uh, Casemiro as a new signing. So there's lots to be hopeful for uh, when that happens. But maybe the fans should protest every week. But Ten Hag had made some very brave decisions. Like Maguire, club captain, un- undroppable, surely, but not under this regime. Well, absolutely. And, and you know, Ten Hag's come into a very rocky club mm. in the summer and he's kept Harry Maguire as captain. He hasn't gone, you know, above and beyond and said, actually, do you know what? I'm changing that. He's kept him. So to drop him, even though he's kept him as captain, is, is such a huge decision. And if it had gone wrong, then there would be questions to be asked. Of course there would be. But he's tried Harry in the first two games and it hasn't worked. And he's tried Varane at half-time against Brentford. He came on and Martinez obviously played against Brentford and was taken off. So mm-hmm. he's, he's had different combinations in central defence. And this one he stuck with. He stuck with Varane and he stuck with Martinez. And ironically, I suppose, when, when the fans are saying that it looks like a team that hasn't ever played together, well, those two hadn't played together and they actually worked very, very well. Mm, yeah. So I think that's the central defence partnership moving forward. I think it'll be very difficult for Maguire to get back in straight away. I think he will be used, of course he will, because there's just so many games that will go on throughout the season. But dropping Ronaldo, dropping Maguire, absolutely huge decisions, but it's worked. And that's the most important thing at the end of the day. It's about three points. It's about getting and registering wins. So your yeah. fans can be happy on, on that part as well. He gets that immediate justification for those big mm. decisions and that's what you want. And no, no better way to get that than beating Liverpool. Perhaps they weren't at their best, Liam. They've had a bad start to the yeah. season. You could say two points now from three games and sitting behind United, which we thought was yeah impossible before before sure. last night's match. But these things happen. Fair play to, uh, to Ten Hag for taking those decisions. And apart from swearing live on Sky Sports, <laughs> as he did afterwards, uh, he seems to be getting a, a squad rallying around him, which is exactly what you want. I thought the rebirth, of, and it's not, I think that might be a little bit too harsh, but um, Rashford sure. looking like he's enjoying playing football again is a big positive, isn't it, with a homegrown man like him? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Rashford has sort of been symbolic of a poor regime at Manchester United in the last two years. You know, sort of back end of Mourinho and then Ralph Rangnick, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, all of that sort of mixing together and players have suffered for it. Um, Rash has got a long way to go to get back to where he was, sort of under Louis van Gaal and early Mourinho. Yes. But, um, you know, last night proved again, you put him on the left wing, you put him in between, in between the right back and the centre half, uh, that type of channel, as we saw for Martial setting him up, that's where he, you know, excels and that's where you can get the best out of him. So as long as he keeps performing, and I think the added pressure, we'll get onto it, I'm sure, in a minute, but new players potentially coming in in those wide areas should hopefully give an added incentive to raise those performance levels. Definitely. Um, all right, let's talk about some of these new guys who are coming in. Casemiro, obviously, is already there. Um, yep. I throw a few points at you, and there is an article up on bookmakers.com, which, which you penned yourself, Liam, and people should go and read it on bookmakers.com about these uh, three players we're about to discuss. But Casemiro is the first one. Um, his age, his wages... And, uh, yeah, is this a little bit of a panic situation or is this someone who was always on the list? 
Sure. I, I think you can look at it both ways. They are huge wages. There's a big transfer fee around £60 million. Pounds. Mm. He's on wages of more than £350,000 per week. One of the top earners at Manchester United now. On the contrast to that, they had to get a player in that position. Simple as that. They couldn't go another season using McTominay and Fred, who aren't natural defensive midfielders. They are more box-to-box midfielders. You can't use them as a midfield duo anymore. You've seen what's happened in the last 12 to 18 months. They get overrun in any game situation. Mm. So they had to sign someone. Yes, they were linked with Frankie de Jong, but again, he's not a number number six. He's number eight and more of an advanced player in that midfield. Casemiro is absolutely pivotal to Eric Ten Hag's regime. I don't know if he was on the list to begin with as the priority number one, but he's become available later in the window. It is big wages, but as Eric Ten Hag said last night, he will be the cement between the rocks. You know, he will sit in front of the, that defence and, and shore it up. And you've seen over sort of, I don't know, seven years that he's been at Real Madrid, the trophies he's won, the performances he's put in, the man of the match against Liverpool in the Champions League final. He's an absolutely fantastic player. Uh, and everyone who's, you know, at the top of the game in football has also said that. And any teammate has said that. He's a great professional, a great leader, a great captain, potentially um, in the future. And I think that's what Manchester United need. Yeah. Big statement player for sure. Likely he will set up most of all with his Brazilian counterpart Fred in the middle, you'd think. I think so. You know, I think Ten Hag will eventually want to move more into a 4-3-3 rather than a 4-2-3-1. Um, to begin with, it might stay as a 4-2-3-1. Fred to occupy that role next to him. Um, you've seen that in Brazil. I don't think they've lost a game together mm. in, in that partnership in Brazil. Um, moving forward, if they manage to bring in Frankie de Jong, which is a massive if, as we've all seen, mm. um, then it looks like it will go into a three-man midfield. Bruno Fernandes come in, Eriksen come into that as well. Um, I think, but yeah, as I said, to begin with, it, it would likely be Fred and then Eriksen and, and Bruno to rotate. Sounds like a very sturdy base from which to operate uh from with those two in the middle there. Let's talk about a couple of other players that you mentioned in your column on bookmakers.com. Um, first one being Sir Gino uh, Dest. Now, he's a young Barcelona right back. He is available. He's going to be affordable because of the situation they're in, of course. Uh, what's not to like? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just one of those that Manchester United need competition in places. And Diogo Dallo seems to be Everton Hag's number one choice. Mm. And he's sort of indicated that in his performance last night. Again, I thought he played really, really well. Aaron Wambasaka, who's obviously been signed over the last well, three, four years for £50 million, pounds, just hasn't had sort of the performance levels or, or yeah, the longevity of his performances to begin with um, that sort of says that he should be in the team. And yes, he could be a squad role player, he could be a backup player, he could be in that squad, no problem. But I don't think Wambasaka will want that either. You know, he'll want to kick on and, and perhaps go to a team that will play him week in, week out and give him that sort of foundation block. So Serginio Des. £15 million pounds is sort of the rumour transfer fee there. Yeah. Um, Barcelona, we all know about their financial woes and, and the problems that they've got going on. It wouldn't be a very difficult one to execute. And I just think Ten Hag has made such a, a huge play into the media you know, over the summer months to say, we need competition, we need people in place to compete against the others and, uh, and raise everyone's performances. So I think all round, it makes sense. He has come from Ajax. He knows the Ajax philosophy. He knows that way of football. He knows the style of play that Eric Ten Hag wants. And you've seen a theme going through the whole summer that Ten Hag wants to sign players initially that understand the style of football immediately that he wants to play and has had experience of doing that. So in terms of Martinez, who he brought in, who played absolutely sensational last night, Mal- Malassia as well, left back, was mm-hmm. sensational. You've got these players here that, understand the way he wants to play and have executed it very, very quickly. And that's something that's really, really important going into this season. Yep. Um, he, yeah, I mean, he does sound like a no-brainer. Sensible and exciting at the same time. That's the Gino yeah. Dest. Let's talk about Anthony because we're talking about a Brazilian here who's lighting up the Dutch league, of course. Another one of those Ten Hag disciples like Lissandro Martinez. Um, it sounds like this deal is going to happen. We have a week or so left in the in the window to get it done. It's just that they do like to play hardball with a fit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I had to probably sick of seeing Manchester United pop up on their emails and their yes. phones um, after obviously the whole long drawn out process with Lissandra Martinez. That got drawn out for far too long. You know, it eventually got up to sort of £55 million pounds, mm. um, for him. Hopefully that will be well worth it. And, and that will, you know, as shown last night, he is a quality player and exactly what they need. But Anthony, we're looking at sort of near enough 80 million, which is an extortionate fee. It really is. You can't get away from that. Um, yes, he's had a few good years in, in Brazil, in Brazil, sorry, in Ajax. He's yep. 22 years of age. He's very, very young. He's got a huge ceiling ahead of him. 
oh, sorry, a huge ceiling in terms of his level that he can get to and a great future ahead of him. Yeah. Um, and he is a, a disciple of Eric Ten Hag as well. What United have needed over the last few years is a left footer, right winger. They just not have that. They've always played a right footer on, on the right side and they need someone to cut inside and be able to offer that threat that so many teams have. Well, Anthony's that perfect player. Mm-hmm. He has those characteristics. He has the ability. He has a great sort of uh, career ahead of him. He knows Ten Hag very, very well. Ten Hag knows him. And I think with all the rumours, circulation going around with Ronaldo and what's potentially going on there and the distress and all of that business, it's absolutely essential that United at least get one player in a forward position before the end of the window. Yeah, it really sounds like if he was able to pull these couple of deals off and who knows what might happen with a De Jong, um, then that he's putting his imprint on Manchester United very quickly. Absolutely, and that's what he needed to do. Straight away, you know, there's a lot of criticism and potentially backlash over the player identification that Ten Hag has made, all being from the Dutch league or all being from you know his, his former club. But that's exactly what you need going into a club that has underperformed for two and a half years now. Those players have proven time and time again that they cannot do it. So you need a manager to go in there with a really strong decision-making process, you know, that he's got um, and to imprint that on his own, you know, his own ideas and his own team. And to do that, you need those players. So you need yeah. to trust the manager. If you brought this manager in to try and rebirth Manchester United, as we're trying to call it here, then give him the funds to be able to back him and bring in those players that he wants to excel at the club. That's it's as simple as that. It shouldn't be difficult, but it's been made difficult mm-hmm. over the last sort of seven, eight years. But now we are starting to see Ten Hag's gone in there. He said to the club who he wants, and they're starting to bring those players in, which is pleasing to see. It's not yeah. enough yet, but in the last week, hopefully, you know that will that will change. Well, results change atmosphere. Deals bring excitement. Sure. It is all possible. And um, you did mention Ronaldo just briefly there. I mean, I'm surprised he's not the type of guy who coming to Manchester United when he did had, didn't have a we must be in the Champions League clause. Maybe he sure. has something like that because it seems to have been some agreement that you know now that it's not looking obviously no Champions League this season. It is possible, of course, for next season. Uh, he's probably going to leave, especially if the Anthony deal happens, Liam. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. I think that's why Manchester United are pushing so hard on the Anthony deal. There was a period over the last month when it went quiet. You know, United were seemingly priced out of a move when they when Ajax came back to them and said sort of 70, 75 million pounds, they moved on. They were looking at a player called Cody Gakpo from PSV, who mm-hmm. they're still interested in. Um, but they've gone back to the table to Ajax. They tabled a bid last week. That got rejected. But they've, you know, had further discussions over the weekend and yesterday and um, and tabling a new bid, you know, as early as as tomorrow. So mm-hmm. if that gets if sorry, if Anthony gets brought in, then you would you would assume that Ronaldo will be allowed to leave. How that will look, whether it will be on loan or whether they'll just rip up the contract or they'll pay him off, who knows at this point. But for Eric Ten Hag, if he can't say to Ronaldo, I'm going to pay you every game because he can't, that's just not the way you know Ten Hag wants to play, mm. then the club have got to think and realise that Ronaldo behind the scenes is probably going to be a problem. You know, in terms of limited minutes and the ego that comes with Ronaldo, rightly or wrongly, that's just the way it is you've got to think, OK, it's probably worth cutting ties. For as much as he is a club legend and everyone loves him, you've got to cut ties and you've got to move on and you've got to allow this new manager that you've brought in, that you've identified, that you've selected on your own back and give him the resources to play the football that he wants to play. Yeah. Again, I come back to it. It was indicated last night. It is one game, but it's against a, an absolutely fantastic team in Liverpool. And if he's got them playing against Liverpool like that, let's see how he can do over the next couple of weeks. Does the head say he should go and does the heart say, God, I wish we could find a way to keep Ronaldo? Correct. Uh, spot, okay. spot on. I, I think that's the, the feeling amongst Manchester United fans. As much as he has been a problem in the last 12 months, everyone can see that. There's obviously those, you know, that absolutely love him and adore him for what he's done and what he symbolises at Manchester United. Of course it does. If he was 10 years younger or five years younger, perhaps, and he could press from the front and adapt his game to do that, sure. then absolutely, that would be a perfect situation. But we've got to be realistic. I think that a 38-year-old is not going to be doing that. It's going to be the Ronaldo show and for another season. And that's something that Ten Hag and Manchester United simply can't afford to have. Yep, understood. Um, look, one result, and I'm talking about last night's result, doesn't make Manchester United title contenders or guaranteed top yeah. four finishes. But then equally, you know, the two results before that didn't make them a bad team. Um, what does a good season look like for Ten Hag now um, in terms of, what does he need to do to make this season a success? Yes, he's got a few more deals to bring in. There's a couple of players to integrate. And you don't know what might happen in the next few days in the window. But um, come the end of the season, what will what will look like a success? From a supporter's point of view, Liam, he might have his own targets and he won't tell us. Sure. 
Well, I think, first of all, away from results is performances. That's mm-hmm. what Manchester United fans really want to see. They want to see consistency and they want to see a high level of performance. They want to see what they saw last night over the course of six to 12 months mm-hmm. on a consistent basis. Aggression, front foot playing, you know, chasing the ball down, which sounds absolutely yeah. simplistic because it is, but we've just not seen that and we've not had the pleasure to see that. Um, and you can see when the crowd gets behind the team because of the performance, what it does to the club, what it does to morale, what it does to the energy of the ground. Um, so I think performance is the first and foremost. Following on from that, if performances are good, then you would hope that they would be challenging for a top four position. You know, I'm saying that because the, the top six is really highly contested. You've mm-hmm. seen what happened to Chelsea at the weekend. You've seen City draw at Newcastle. Yep. The Premier League is getting more competitive on, on a on a season by season basis. So a top four competition, uh, so competing for the top four makes absolute sense in terms of a good season. Hopefully they can sneak in there in the fourth place. But if they don't, then it is what it is. Um, and again, in terms of trophies, FA Cup, League Cup, you would expect a run of some sort in the Europa League as well, a run of some sort. I can't sit here and say that they should be demanding a Europa League or, or a League Cup or FA Cup. Who knows? But first and foremost, above anything else, it has to be performances. It has to be the morale of the team and it has to be the energy that goes into those games. Yeah, OK. I think that's the minimum you can expect from what we've seen from Ten Hag so far. Um, it could be exciting times again at Old Trafford. We'll have to see how the next few months play out. <laughs> and of course, those last few days of the transfer window. Uh, Liam Canning, thanks for joining us on bookmakers.com TV. Anyone who hasn't checked you out already on Twitter, go and do that at Liam Paul Canning. And of course, the article is up on bookmakers.com. Thank you very much, Liam. Super. Thanks, Dean. Cheers. Thank you.